Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's afternoon program. As part of one of the South African Bar Association's initiatives, the association hosts a speaker on a weekly basis to deal with a legal topic intended to assist young practitioners with training and development, which is enshrined within the core values that we hold as an organization. This is indeed an honor and it is indeed an honor and privilege to have to host Professor Graham Grogan. By way of providing a brief background of Professor Grogan, and I read the way and I reiterate the word brief, as if I were to provide a comprehensive background, this program would run probably through the evening. Relating to Professor Grogan's experience, he has been a lecturer in political science at the University of Cape Town. He has been a senior lecturer, a professor of law, and of utmost praise, the Dean of Law of Rhodes University. He has been a respected advocate since, since 1999. He has, been at, uh, he has been an admitted advocate as, uh, uh, in 1995, and is currently practicing, as I reiterate, since, since 1999, having acted as counsel before the Constitutional Court, various High Courts, the Labour Appeal Court, and various Labour Courts. He has been at an additional member to, for the Industrial Court. He is currently a part-time senior commissioner for the for the for, sorry, he has been a part-time senior commissioner for the Co Commission for Conciliation, Mediation, and Arbitration for the South African L L Local Bargaining Council, and for the Metal and Industry and Engineering Industries Bargaining Council. He is an acting judge for the High Court of South Africa Eastern Cape Division. He also acted as an acting judge for the Labour Court and is currently conducts numerous private in, uh, arbitrations since 1997. Relating to Professor Grogan's publications, he has, been, he has been a general contributing editor for the Butterworth's Employment Law, an editor for the Butterworth's uh, Labour Law Reports, an editor for the Butterworth's Arbitration Law Reports, and, uh, and the Labour Law Contribution to Juta's Quarterly Review. He has published a number of books on a, on a continuous basis, of which we are all familiar with, such as the Juta Workplace Law, the Juta Collective Labour Law, the Juta Employment Rights, the Juta Dismissal, and the Juta Le uh, Litigation and Dispute Resolution, to name a few. With regard to academic articles, Professor Grogan has contributed ex approximately 95 articles published within the South African Law Journal, the South African Journal of Human Rights, the Industrial Law Journal, and Employment Law. Professor Grogan shall be addressing us on a topic titled, Does Affording an Employee an Opportunity to Make Representations Before a Dismissal is Affected? satisfy the requirements of a fair hearing. In terms of housekeeping, during the address, all participants shall automatically be muted. After the address, there will be a question and answer session whereby all participants shall be unmuted so that they are given the opportunity to ask their question directly to Professor Grogan. Those participants that have a question, kindly raise your hand using the Microsoft Teams platform whereby you can simply unmute your mic and be sure to pose your question directly to Professor Grogan. Furthermore, during the question and answer session, albeit the fact that all participants shall have the functionality of unmuting their mic and video, we humbly request that they only do so after being requested to, but to avoid unnecessary interruptions. Over to you, Professor Grogan. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, for that uh, introduction, which I hardly recognized my, myself. Um, and welcome to everybody. I'm not sure how many uh, people there are, uh, 
present, but it but it doesn't really matter. Um, if I could just start by saying this um, talk comes to you from the depths of the Eastern Cape in the middle of winter and the temperature is currently minus three. So I'm wrapped up in about five jackets. And if I sound a bit muffled, it might be the scarf gets in, in, in the way. Um, I want to begin by emphasizing that I didn't set the question that I was asked to address uh, this afternoon. I'm not sure who said it, um, but I just want to make a small correction to the manner in which uh, Ahmed um, read it out because he left out a critical word. And I'm just going to repeat the question. Does being granted an opportunity to make written representations prior to a dismissal satisfy the requirements of a fair hearing? And the word Ahmed inadvertently left out was written. And I think that makes an important um, an important difference. Um, it's always, of course, um, difficult to address a question in vacuo without a context. And I suspect that the draft of the question might have dredged it up from some old law exam. So I'm going to start by asking everybody to, if you've got a pen in your hand and perform a little exercise and draw four little blocks, one below the other. And when you've done that, I want to treat this provisionally as a multiple choice question. So we've got the question, does being granted an opportunity to make written representations to a dismissal satisfy the requirements of a fair hearing? The first block is yes. The second block is no. The third block is maybe. And the fourth block is who cares? And I'd like you to tick your block. I'm not going to ask you now which one you've you've ticked. And I'll address the respective answers in those um, in those terms and in that order. Now, just before we start on addressing the, the yeses and the noes and the maybes and the who cares, let me begin with the real basics. And I want to ask the, the question, where does the right to make representations prior to a dismissal come from? Is it a right? Is it an absolute right? And does the law prescribe the form in which, if it is a right, that right must be must be exercised? And of course, as a starting point, when we're dealing with dismissal, we need to go to two sources or perhaps three. And the first source is obviously the LRA and its various um, and its various schedules. The second source is the common law of contract. And the third source is administrative law. And if we just pause on those for a moment and go through them one by one, the Labor Relations Act, as we all know, um, defines a dismissal. It tells us um, that the dismissal must be for a fair reason. 
and it also tells us that it must be in accordance with a fair procedure. The common law contract of employment does not provide for a hearing prior to dismissal, and it does not provide that there must be a fair reason for the dismissal, unless, and of course it's an important unless, the contract expressly or by necessary implication implies that the employee is entitled for to a fair hearing before the um, the contract is terminated. When it comes to administrative law, there is a general principle, and I'm talking here not even um, with the promotion of administrative justice in mind, uh, act in mind, but there is a general principle called the Audi Alteram Partem principle that requires um, uh, a fair procedure before prejudicial action is taken against anybody, including an employee who in this case would be in the public service. So we've got those origins of the right. The right is incipient. And the question in any case, of course, is in the circumstances, can an employee draw the right to make representations? And I'm not talking about written representations at this point. I'm, making, I'm talking about any representations from any one of those particular sources. Now, I don't want to go all over the place, but I'd like to start with the Labor Relations Act, because the Ra Labor Relations Act, as we know, um, covers all employees with the with the odd exception. Um, and we won't deal with those for the moment. And the Labor Relations Act, as I've said, says that any dismissal must be in accordance with a fair procedure. That's section 188, I think it is 188. And then what it does is refer one to the Code of Good Practice dismissal. And I just want to read out the relevant uh, section of that just to remind us, but it's quite a good thing to go to basics occasionally. And it says um, in uh, item 2.1, a dismissal is unfair if it is not affected for a fair reason and in accordance with a fair procedure, even if it complies with any notice period in a contract. Um, sorry, I've got I've got the wrong section. I just wanted to, to deal with um, and we move to 4.1, and then it goes on to say, normally the employer should conduct an investigation to determine whether there are grounds for dismissal. This no does not need to be a formal inquiry. The employer should notify the employee of the allegations using a form and language that the employee can reasonably understand. And then importantly, for present purposes, the employee should be allowed the opportunity to state a case in response to the allegations. And he should be afforded a reasonable time to do so. Now, state a case is a term that doesn't occur everywhere, but it's not defined anywhere. So one has to move off then to the law to find out what that means. Now remember, we discussing written representations. That is the question we are addressing. And that would embrace a situation where instead of holding a, um, 
a formal disciplinary hearing, um, calling the employer in, having an initiator, having an independent or uh, internal chairperson, uh, and holding a disciplinary inquiry with all the accoutrements uh, that I've just described, that is always sufficient, and that is what is contemplated, usually contemplated when one uses the term disciplinary hearing. But in this situation, we're contemplating another situation, and that is where the employer, instead of doing all of that, simply, simply writes a letter or calls the employee in and says, look, we have evidence that you are guilty of fraud and it's cost the company a million rand. I'm giving you two days to write to us and tell us why we shouldn't be dismissed. And that is the scenario that is contemplated, I think, by the by the question. And if you've ticked the top box, um, then you say that that is sufficient. Now, you, 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 if you've done so, you, you partly, you partly correct, you get 50%. But when I had occasion to uh, look at one of my books to see what it said about it. It cited a number of situations um, and, and, and leads in, the paragraph in, uh, um, in question leads in with so words to the effect that it is sufficient in exceptional circumstances to proceed in the way I've just um, in the way I've just described. Now, what are those exceptional uh, circumstances? Um, I've had a quick look at the case law, and it's by no means a comprehensive list, but the few cases that I found describe examples in which it has been held to be in order not to hold a disciplinary hearing, but simply to invite the employees or employee to make written representations. And the, the first case I came across contemplates this kind of situation. An employer, a certain state-owned enterprise, which we listen to and view every evening, discovers that something like 250 employees have been parties, party to fraudulently claiming from the medical aid. It was a scheme that seems to have been piloted by some sort of um, uh, scam group but all the employees were involved. So the situation that it was the SABC that it was confronted with was sticking to, either sticking to its disciplinary inquiry, uh, sorry, its disciplinary code, which required formal disciplinary hearing before um, dismissal or using some kind of truncated procedure. And it did. It decided on the latter. And it appointed an external arbitrator and then wrote to each employee concerned and their unions and said, make representations. In writing um, uh, as to why you shouldn't be dismissed, the arbitrator will consider them, or the internal, uh, the, the chairperson will consider them, and if 
he's not satisfied with your explanation, he will proceed to call for um, uh, written submissions in mitigation on the same basis. So everything was going to be in writing. And Bamawu, one of the unions, took the matter to the Labour Court with an urgent interdict. And you'll find that uh, judgment, I'm not giving the precise citation, but in the 2016 uh, ILJ, Bamawu versus SABC, and Bamawu's argument was <laughs> that, look, the SABC is bound by the um, uh, the disciplinary code, which is a collective agreement and forms part of the employee's contracts of employment. Uh, they're not doing that. This system falls far short of that, and we want an interdict uh, restraining uh, the, the SABC from continuing in this way, and we want an order that they must stick to their disciplinary code. And the court adopted a fairly robust <laughs> approach and said, look, um, disciplinary hearings are all very well, but they, <laughs> they need to be, um, they need to be fair, well, the process needs to be fair, but the Labor Relations Act is there not only to be fair to employees, but also to be fair to the employer. And the judge, it was Lagrange, Jay, I, I think, um, said, um, no, sorry, it was the late uh, Anton Steenkamp, said it would be ridiculous to require independent uh, hearings for each and every one of these employees because the SABC wouldn't ever be able to continue with its normal business and dismissed the application and said in the, in, in, in the, in the course of the judgment that um, fairness is a flexible concept. And in doing and, and in, in making that um, that observation, he he referred to a very important judgment that embraces um, many of the principles of what constitutes a fair hearing under the Labor Relations Act. Um, and that was the the judgment of uh, Van Nicker J in Avril Elizabeth home. I'm sure you, you will all have heard of that. And in that judgment, in Avril Elizabeth home, for Nick Kirk, and I'm not going to quote the relevant passages, but he says, and I just perhaps just get the thing. Um, uh, among other things, he says, the and I'm quoting Van Nickerk from the Avril Elizabeth Home Judgment, the balance struck by the Labor Relations Act thus recognizes not only that managers are not experienced judicial officers, but also that workplace efficiencies should not be unduly impeded by onerous procedural requirements. It also recognizes that to require onerous workplace disciplinary procedures is inconsistent with the right to expeditious arbitration on merits. And then he proceeds um, to make an important observation. He says, well, in any event, if the employees, um, if employees are prejudiced in any way by deficiencies in the internal disciplinary process, they've got a remedy. They can go to the CCMA or the Bargaining Council uh, in misconduct cases, of course, and there they will get a complete, fresh hearing, de novo hearing. So 
there's no reason, according to the um, Avril Elizabeth judgment, to go to endless lengths um, to uh, to to ensure what uh, Fanica J described as the criminal justice mode that was applicable under the previous Labor Relations Act. Now, that case didn't turn directly on written representations, but I'm just going to give you one other example of a scenario in which written representations were held to be sufficient. And that is the judgment in Matabati, M-A-T-H-A-B-A-T-E versus um, Nelson Mandela Bay Metropolitan Municipality. Now, that that case I was I was personally involved in because I um, uh, acted as um, prosecutor or initiator or whatever you might describe it in a disciplinary hearing that was convened uh, for a senior manager who had been charged with pretty serious financial uh, offences. And when we arrived at the disciplinary venue, we found ourselves confronted with um, with a senior counsel, a junior counsel, two attorneys from Johannesburg, and they applied for a postponement. And the reason that they gave for a postponement was that um, Ms. Matabati had had um, uh, a nervous breakdown and couldn't appear. And the municipality opposed the postponement and said, well, you know, where's the medical proof? And the medical proof was produced and it showed a prognosis that um, was indefinite. So the municipality was confronted with a situation of having to agree to a postponement for an indefinite duration um, which it wasn't prepared to do. So it persuaded the presiding officer to say, well, all right, then if that's the case, she, the Miss Matabati is assisted by legal counsel and so on and so forth. So let's proceed by way of written representations. And the uh, presiding officer agreed. And I'm not going to go into the reasons he gave, but the long and the short of it was, and this is where it provides yet another example, was that he did proceed and the Ms. Matabati's legal team marched off to the Labour Court uh, and sought an interdict. And the matter came again before Judge Fanicker and he, in that judgment, reverted to the Avril Elizabeth Home judgment and said, yes, um, Ms. Matabati is entitled to a formal disciplinary hearing, and she's got it. And the question is whether the change in the format of the disciplinary hearing conformed with the requirements of the LRA. And there again, he went back to Avril Elizabeth home and he said she would suffer absolutely no prejudice by that and dismissed the, dismissed the, the, the application. So that, that provides yet another instance in which um, written representations have been held to be sufficient. Another which comes to mind would be, for example, where the employee um, was not only charged with an internal disciplinary offence, but also a, 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 a criminal charge and is under arrest or perhaps even convicted by a criminal court 
and therefore can't um, attend a disciplinary hearing. The general law is he's entitled to some sort of representation. Is it enough to allow um, him or her to make written representations? And the case law there again suggests that that would be fine. One more example is where the employee has had a disciplinary hearing and the presiding officer has made a recommendation, only a recommendation, and management looks at the recommendation, which is, say, for example, a final written warning, doesn't like it, and decides that it wants to alter or substitute the sanction with the sanction of dismissal. In those cases, the law says that the employee is entitled to some sort of hearing before the final decision is taken by management. And in most cases, it would appear that written representations will suffice in, in that case. And then last example is, for example, strike dismissals and other mass misconduct dismissals. Um, a collective hearing is held in most of those instances to be sufficient. But what if the the uh, the strike has been violent and the employer is afraid to allow all the employees to come in and make their representations. In those kind of instances, it will probably be held, I would suggest and has been held, um, that written representations are sufficient. I'm not going to give you any more examples, but I just want to read um, a quote and I have to turn away just to get it. It's on another computer um, from an earlier judgment uh, in Nguchani versus Aravia.com. And it's a long judgment, but it ends with an interesting observation which might be food for thought in relation to the question we're addressing. And, and it says, it's, it's actually the penultimate paragraph. In circumstances where an employee's misconduct is manifest, common cause, or not in dispute, a less formal process will suffice. In those circumstances, an employer's invitation to an employee to make representations, written representations in this instance, is eminently reasonable and fair. In conceiving the notion of effective dispute resolution, the LRA does not prescribe a painstaking process of convening an elaborate disciplinary hearing for every dismissal. So what she's saying there is where the employer is so convinced of the guilt, and it's conclusively proved on the papers, there, as in that case, written, written representations were held to be sufficient. Now, I know I've talked too long, but I just wanted to, to deal with the, the, the ticks in the box. Well, if you said no, uh, you should have said no, but <laughs> in relation to the to the um, the exceptions that I've that I've just um, discussed, maybe is probably the safest answer. But just let me touch on the on the who cares box because what I had in mind in in, in putting that in somewhat facetiously was a situation 
and and there there are a couple of recorded cases in the in in the in the case law in 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 in, the, in among the authorities uh, where this situation arises. The um, the employer convenes a formal disciplinary hearing. Um, the employee arrives um, uh, with the usual legal team, senior counsel downwards, as in the Matabati case. Uh, the employer says, well, look, you're not allowed in here um, because um, our disciplinary code doesn't provide for legal representation. And the legal representatives say, no, 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 uh, we just had to take some points in limine and then proceeds to obfuscate the situation with these kind of in limine points and postponements and uh, applications for recusal of the presiding officer and all of that stuff. And the um, employer, who's now had to engage its own legal team, discovers it's running up costs of hundreds of thousands in legal, in legal costs. And the situation that I've contemplated with the who cares <laughs> block is what stops the employer from saying, look, we're sick of all these processes and um, we're calling off these disciplinary hearings and you just make written representations and we'll make a decision on, on those. What will probably follow would be an application for an interdict um, prohibitory interdict, uh, prohibiting the company from, from doing that, um, um, which could be resisted on the, on, the, on the basis of some of the authorities that I've given. But the more important thing is that the worst that could happen to the employer in those circumstances would be um, that the employee would get some sort of compensation. Bart, I see you, you want me to stop. And if the employer, and here's where I'm going to stop, if the employer says, well, um, here's our proof that the dismissal is substantively fair, the employee will probably only get nominal con uh, compensation of about a month. So, uh, so it may be worth a candle just to take a robust approach in those kinds of circumstances, um, call it a day and proceed robustly. Um, I, see, I see questions, so I'm going to stop talking for the moment. Perhaps we can come back to illustrative points with questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. There's a question from Advocate Bart Ford. Advocate Bart? Uh, uh, Prof. Logan, I, I, my, my question was not intended to stop you from doing your continuing with the presentation. I must indicate that up front. Not at all, not at all. I talked too long anyway. No, that's perfectly in order. I, I think I've got two questions. The first being, uh, it would appear from listening to you that the idea of conducting a disciplinary hearing by way of written representations ought to be the exception as opposed to the norm. Correct. That's the question. The second question I have is, in circumstances, and I'm going to give you the example, where, um, and I'm going to particularly say this is a state-owned company who has a policy uh, directing that if the executive or the CEO is unhappy with the outcome uh, of a disciplinary hearing or the sanction that was recommended by an, a chairperson that they may substitute that decision yes. with uh, what they consider to be a more appropriate decision. So uh, what happened in this particular case is the disciplinary hearing was conducted, the employee was found uh, not guilty in some of the charges, and in some of the charges were given a written or final written warning. 
the uh, chief executive officer then says, on account of the policy that provides for me to interfere, I'm interfering with that decision uh, on the grounds of exceptional circumstances, but doesn't disclose what the so-called exceptional circumstances are, and substituted the decision uh, uh, for, for one of dismissal. Um, and indicate that to the extent that the employee wishes to make representations that they, he is free to do so. And the employee is saying, but I've gone through a disciplinary process and I've been found not guilty. Why must I now be given a further opportunity to make representations to determine whether or not I should be dismissed or not? So that's the question. <laughs> uh, Bart, I'm, I'm not sure if you set the initial question, <laughs> but be that as may, I, I did touch on I did touch on that example that I gave, and what you've done is opened uh, you've you've you you you've opened a potential hornet's nest because what we're touching on here, of course, is the principle of double jeopardy, which is a whole nother story, and we can't go into it. But just addressing the question in the, you see, well, what I would say is what we've got here is not a case of double jeopardy. We've got a case of managerial interference with a um, uh, uh, with the outcome of disciplinary proceedings. And you know, as I understand the law at the moment, if if the disciplinary code provides, and this provide, this applies in the public sector and the private sector as well, uh, provides that the disciplinary tribunal, its function is to finally determine the dispute. Then the CEO, whoever it is, senior management, can't intervene. But where the decision is merely a recommendation, it can, in principle. But then the question arises, well, um, uh, what are the requirements of fairness in that context? Now, your question suggests that it's not permissible at all. Your employee is saying, well, why must I go through this all again? Um, the CEO's answer would be, well, <laughs> I've looked at the recommendation. It's only a recommendation. Um, so therefore, I'm giving you an opportunity to make your representations, and I'll consider them. And in those circumstances, it seems, <clears throat> it seems that written representations suffice. In other words, the employer doesn't have to reconvene the disciplinary proceedings. But if the, the disciplinary code um, doesn't provide for such intervention, or if it precludes such intervention, well, then the employer's remedy is to go to the labour court, um, is is to go to the labour court and either, either to go to the labour court and get an interdict to 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 stop the CEO from making the decision, or to go to the CCMA or the Bargaining Council or whatever, assuming it's a misconduct, and claim that the dismissal was unfair. But the problem is that um, the point that would be taken in relation to the interference is only a procedural error. So that employee can't claim reinstatement on that, on that basis alone. Um, can only claim a procedural error and uh, work a defect um, and then seek compensation. But Bart, we we might be heading down a, a long road. Maybe somebody else will, wants to pick that that up. So we shall we go to another question? Uh, Gloria, you may simply unmute your mic. Gloria. All right, uh, Hasina Kassim. Hasina Kassim, you may simply unmute your mic.
Messina. Okay, uh, but, uh, sorry, Prof, can you just give me one second? I think um, I think the participants are having a bit of an issue, which is uh, Microsoft Teams issue for that matter. Um, I'm just going to try this again. Gloria, now could you simply just... Oh, unmute? oh thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Prof, I have a question. When the employees are dismissed uh, based on a hearing, uh, the, the charges are related to refusal to do functions that are not uh, on their contract of the employment. Two, they are not being paid for doing these functions and then they get dismissed. So when they get to a bargaining council, then the employer changes uh, the allegation to the fact that the employees was, were on strike. And uh, the matter then is being dismissed on those bases that uh, they were on strike uh, at the bargaining council. But in their internal disciplinary hearing, the strike was not, was not an issue. And then they, they did not represent themselves against a strike. They come across a strike when they go to the bargaining council. Then uh, how do you think one deals with that? Uh, Gloria, we've gone slightly out of the terms of reference of our of our discussion, but uh, but I'll give you a short answer to that. The uh, I think it's a trite principle that the fairness the fairness of a dismissal is assessed according to the reasons for the dismissal at the time of the dismissal. So, an employer can't come along and say, "Well, um, I dismissed." this employee for late coming and then when you get to the bargaining council you say well I subsequently discovered he stole something uh, and that's exactly what it seems to me that has happened in this instance uh, you can't invoke a new reason in arbitration even though the arbitration is a hearing de novo it's a hearing de novo and an inquiry into the reason for the dismissal given by the employer at the time of the termination. So I would say that 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 is an incorrect decision if the uh, uh, if the arbitrator went along with it. Thank you very much, Prof. You've answered my question. For what it's worth, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Uh, there's a question from. Uh, uh, forgive me for my spelling, Mo um, or for my pronunciation rather, Mohira. Mohira, you can unmute your mic. Mine is very simple. In the workplace, you'll find the labor department, and its role is to advise the employer and the employees. But many times we see uh, this uh, labor department siding with the employer in most cases, and uh, in their role to facilitate the Labor Relations Act within the work environment, it gets compromised because uh, they seem to lean more on the side of the employer. And I feel that most, most of employees are not getting justice from labor department uh, departments, uh, especially in, uh, in the public sector. How do we deal with this issue so that uh, the Labor Department and their staff should play a middleman role between the employee who are charged and the employer? I don't think that uh, they are getting a fair treatment from these departments. And many times we take matters to the Labor Court or to the CCMA or to the bargaining councils, and most of the time they lose cases, these people, because they fear their employers from Labor Departments. How can you advise on that uh, matter, uh, Prof? Whoa, that's a, it's a good question, but it's a very difficult one to answer, um, you know, without, without reference to the facts itself. But I mean, of course, an HR department um, is, shouldn't be there to act in a, in, in, in a, in a, in a biased um, fashion. And if it does so, it ought to come out uh, and there is a dismissal in consequence of, 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 of incorrect advice. It ought to come out in the bargaining council um, or, or, or the labor courts. Um, so I guess, I mean, the only thing that I can say is you soldier on and, 
and 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 fight for the rights of that particular employee um, in the context of the particular case. Um, you know, that's that's about all I can I can say on that for what it's worth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, this question from Hasina Kassim. Hasina Kassim, you can simply unmute your mic. Um, thanks, Prof. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, Prof, I have, mine is a sort of a two-part question. Um, first question is, these written submissions, do they have to only be considered in light of a properly and formally formulated chart sheet? The second part of my question is, if the employee made representation in writing or orally as part of a preliminary investigation, would that suffice as written submissions? And the th that's, so that's my part two. And, two. and the second part of part two is if the employee made these submissions in terms of the written uh, preliminary investigation, and the investigator's recommendation was that there was no merit to the charge, but the employer persisted with the charge. Can the employee then um, raise a, a, a point of double jeopardy? Thank you. Um, if I perhaps I could start at the at the end. Um, and, 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 and when Bart asked his first question, I said we're opening a, a, a hornet's nest when we start referring to, to, double, to double jeopardy. So in this instance, the employee presumably was um, confronted with, with various charges prior to a suspension, say, and made a statement. And then during the suspension, the employer looked at those representations. I mean, the the prosecutor or the initiator looked at the representations and said, no, I don't think there's a case. And management says, well, we think there is. And continues. I, I don't think we have here a case of double jeopardy. Double jeopardy um, only arises when the employee has actually gone through the formal process and there's been a finding and a penalty imposed and then the employer comes along and says um, and, the, and, and the employer comes along and says I'm changing it and I'm going to hold another hearing. Now in this instance I don't hear the employer doing that is 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 that right um yes prof that's correct they just uh, persisted with a specific allegation or a charge yes i look I, I, so 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 the case for that employer would be no the initiator the initiator didn't even want to proceed, but management did proceed, and now I find myself dismissed. Is is that correct? Well, it was raised as a point in limine at the actual hearing, at the disciplinary inquiry, um, yes. where in fact the employee says, "Well, I already answered to these allegations in my in the preliminary investigation. In fact, the investigator accepted what I submitted, and said there is no reason to persist with this." charge or allegation and yet you as an employer persisting and I'm now raising issues of double jeopardy. Um, so I'm not, so that's that's yeah. the context. Yeah, okay, see, that's the scenario. Well, uh, um, I think the presiding officer would be quite entitled to say, I hear you, but the employer wants to proceed. So let's hear the matter. But I, I, I can't accept that this is a situation of double jeopardy simply because the initiator has made that suggestion. And I, and I don't think if one went off, if the presiding officer did that, that if one went off to the Labour Court for an interdict, for example, um, it would succeed. 
I don't know if that's the answer that you that, wanted. That does, that does answer the question, Prof. Just on my other question, though, these written submissions, do they only have to be made in the context of a formal charge? Well, yes, because it's no use asking a person to to make written submissions in vacuo. Um, you know, you've got to say, this is what we accuse you of and and make your written submissions. I mean, that certainly was the case in that Ngachani judgment that I referred to earlier. Um, you know, it's not enough to just say, um, we think you're guilty of misconduct. Tell us why we shouldn't dismiss you. Um, uh, uh, I think Prasa walked into that trap in, in, uh, in two recent judgments. And the court said, but how on earth do you expect the person to respond? So I think it's implicit in what I say about written submissions that yes, the employer must be the employee must be given a charge and some semblance. For example, if there's been a forensic investigation, um, you the employer I think would be advised to give the employee um, if you're going to go the written representation route the forensic investigation and say, look, it's a long document. There it is. It points to your guilt. Now tell us why um, why we shouldn't dismiss you in, uh, on that basis. Thank, thank you, Prof. That's most helpful. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> but I must say um, that I'm very, very cagey about making sweeping statements in vacuo but at least it's something to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Prof Kogan, I see that it's almost uh, 5 p.m. And, and probably minus four degrees where you are now. However, there are a number of questions from participants. No, I'm, I'm quite questions. happy to, Maybe to go, in, as long as you don't mind my shivering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose the next uh, questions for you, uh, Prof. I have three questions uh, for you. Uh, do you have your pen ready? Uh, must I write them down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Prof, the first question uh, deals with answering the question of. Um, does affording an employee an opportunity to make written representations before a dismissal is affected satisfy the requirements of fair hearing in three forms by way of your four blocks? The said four blocks being one, yes, two, no, three, maybe, and four, who cares? In my view of your, uh, in, and in light of your address today and of your uh, of quoting of the various case laws you have referred to, my submission is that I would go for block four, right? As in, and, and that would be who cares, would you, and that question being, would you agree with such submission? The second question relates to the, to the third edition of your law book, uh, uh, titled Dismissal, which is indeed a brilliant, informative, and interesting publication. And I encourage all legal practitioners to read such. We have heard in television shows the code you fired being used widely. Examples of such would be from the, uh, from the erstwhile uh, United States of America's president show prior to him being appointed as president. And on a lighter note, during his term as presidency as well. Moving on swiftly, of, in, of interest, uh, dictionaries define the word, the verb fire as to indicate, to ignite, to cause to explode, to go explode, to heat, to carcerate, to bake, to dismiss. In a model, in a modern world, the word fire is now used subject to different legal constraints. In South Africa, dismissals are the most common cause of law of labor, law of labor disputes, and the most frequently encountered problem in the workplace. Your publications deals with inter alia the legal issues that arise from the termination of employment. Now, what your publication did not deal with is Section 189 of the Labor Relations Act in view of the current economical climate. Now, many employees are 
uh, and many employers rather are affecting dismissals which are subjectively deemed to be, which I subjectively deem to be unfair dismissals under the disguise of the, of the provisions enshrined within section 189. This seems to be a current or a current common practice, as I said, in view of the economical climate and the financial desperation of employees. What is your submission to the misuse of section 189 or in that regard? My third and last question refers to no, what it's your mentioned. first question. It's Sorry. your first question. No, that's <laughs> not. Forgive me. Uh, my, my, uh, it refers to what you mentioned in your address today pertaining to strikes and protests. Now, I speak from personal experience where our employees have recently uh, simply downed tools on the advice of NUMSA for a mere for an increase of salary, knowing fully well that such would cost the plant in a region of around millions or something close to like 1.2 million rand per day. Now, this would result in literally holding the employee to what I would term as an economical hostage under the ratio of an employee's right to protest. It is my submission that such is merely a ruse to obtain an increase in their salary, which is not provided for within, the, within their contract of employment. What is your submission in that regard? Or alternatively, what, what is your advice in that regard? Well, um, you didn't explain why you ticked the, the who cares box, but we'll leave that. Just dealing with your section 189 question, um, you know, the, the, the LRA provides for four reasons for, uh, three reasons for dismissal. One is related to the employee's conduct, the other to um, the employee's capacity, um, and the other to operational requirements. And I suppose it's arguable <coughs> that all dismissals are in the end for operational requirements. I mean, you, you don't just dis dismiss people for fun. And um, if you dismiss someone for theft, of course, it's a misconduct matter. But it could equally be argued that it's, um, it's an operational matter because we can't afford to keep thieves uh, on our staff. But the act, in its wisdom, has, has created those categories and I'm not going to cite case law in, 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 in great detail, but or any detail at all, but there is abundant case law to the effect that um, an employer may not use um, operational requirements um, or, or, or the justification of operational requirements to dismiss people for an ulterior purpose. And the ulterior purpose in this instance would be, for example, to say, ah, oh, we don't feel like you stole, we don't feel like going, uh, going through a whole disciplinary process. So let's consult quickly and you out of here. Um, the courts will not, will not accept, I mean, that's a gross example, but the courts will not accept um, employers invoking just general operational requirements to evade the um, the procedures um, for misconduct or incapacity required by the the, the act. Um, your 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 other question, Ahmed, dealing with um, holding economic hostage. Um, you know, the right to strike is built into our act and constitution. And um, you mentioned NUMSA in particular, and I know NUMSA is a very um, vocal and active union. Uh, I've acted for it m many times. Um, but, and yes, it may well be that in calling for a strike, um, in calling for a strike, the 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 um, 
the union is metaphorically speaking holding the employer hostage and the and and, and it's arguable that that the union should know that the employer can't afford it but legally speaking that isn't an argument against this the strike per se um, the courts have held time and time again that the reasonableness or otherwise of a union's demand um, in a mutual interest dispute is not a matter for judicial intervention but where the strike turns violent and I think you have that in mind uh, where the strike turns violent then of course the courts draw the line um, and they draw the line far more effectively if I might say so uh, than the state did with the activities last week there have been judgment after judgment in which strikes um, or strikers have been interdicted from unlawful um, from unlawful conduct and then of course if they carry on there's always the backstop of contempt proceedings um, so yeah maybe I agree with you in principle in your observation in that relation um, but there's pretty much nothing that an employer can do simply because it disagrees with the um, the reason for the strike provided the employer provided the the union has gone through the very elementary procedural steps that are required before calling that strike as long as the strike is protected um, yeah okay I'll stop on that one thanks Ruff. you've you've answered that um, you've answered that uh, well thanks um, uh, Prof, there's a question from from Judge Graham. Jam, uh, Judge Graham, you can simply unmute your mic. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I. Yes, I. I can. Okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to identify you in the. Yeah, but I, I. I can. Okay, I've just been asked to unmute my mic and not my video. If I had well, my that's video, that's Judge Mashwanda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Judge Jackson. Judge for you. Please do unmute your. Please do your video as well if you if if you deem fit. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'm sure um, Prof has already recognized me. <laughs> I have. <clears throat> Prof, there are well, maybe there are three questions, but the one is in the form of a comment. And uh, maybe built in it a a question. And 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 the comment is the following: In my view, the controversy or the issue with the written representation often arises in the so-called right to cross-examination. The question is, is that right of cross-examination an integral part of a fair hearing? That's the first question based on the comment that I have stated earlier. The second part of the question is, you have made reference to the provisions of Schedule 8 where the legislature deemed it appropriate to say all what the employee is entitled to is to state a case. Now, you are correct. I have not come across any definition of what this state case, state a case means. But then can we make an, an assumption that that state a case encapsulates the right to cross-examination, which we know that in a written representation situation, that right is simply not capable of being exercised. That's the, the second part of the question. 
third and last is in your address you mentioned that um, written representations should be or possibly be allowed in exceptional circumstances of course you gave an example of what those exceptional circumstances would be. But if one has regard to item four, four, I think, of the schedule, it does say that in exceptional circumstances, non-compliance with the pre-dismissal procedures is allowed. That, in my mind, is the exceptional circumstances. And that exceptional circumstances also exclude the stating of the case, whatever meaning you would want to attach to it. Correct. So th those are the three questions and comments, if you like. Thank you, Pro. Th thank you so much for that, uh, Judge, because um, it was a, it was an omission of mine, um, I think for purposes of saving time, to to not read out um, uh, uh, item four four, which reads uh, slightly differently from the way you, you put it, but I mean you've got it correctly. It, it it actually reads in exceptional circumstances if the employer cannot reasonably be expected to comply with these guidelines, the employer may dispense with pre-dismissal proceedings. So you're absolutely right. That means all the proceedings. Um, and that would contemplate your well-known situation where there's a, a, a riotous situation and 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 the, um, uh, the employer's got to act with utmost urgency and so on. But... Um, and, and you're also right in saying that um, item 4.4 encapsulates all the proceedings as opposed to merely merely written proceedings. But that doesn't, in, on, on my reading, um, say that the, uh, having regard to section, subsection 4, doesn't necessarily mean that an employer can dispense with a particular requirement um, that that those general exceptional proceedings, sorry, those general exceptional um, circumstances uh, must exist, or the, 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 the exceptional circumstances contemplated in subsection 4 must exist before written representations may be allowed. I think something less is contemplated by by the use of exceptional circumstances when it comes to written representations in particular. But maybe that could be answered um, with reference to your, um, your, your first and second questions. And that is, you, you're also absolutely right, because the main objection to written representations is even if those written representations are in affidavit form, I mean, we, we have that coming up in court all the time. If there's a conflict, um, a, 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 a material, con factual conflict in affidavits before a court in motion proceedings, well, it will call for, um, the court can refer it for oral evidence precisely so that it can be tested by way of evidence and cross-examination and and so on. So I think the main objection to written representation is the ability to confront your accuser, so to speak, and to ask um, those questions. So then we come to your 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 third your second question, <clears throat> which is. Um, uh, can you make an assumption that the reference to state a case in in subsection two embraces anything more than written 
representations. And I don't think you can in vacuo because there again, you know, I need to refer you to um, the Avril Elizabeth Home case where um, Van Nickerk J sets out the requirements of a fair pre-dismissal hearing in such broad terms that it could encompass a brief conversation with the employee. And there he makes the very important point that um, you can't expect your full uh, entitlement to justice with all its procedural accoutrements in the disciplinary hearing. Where you can get it is in the arbitration proceedings that follow in a misconduct case. And and, and that raises a point that I, I wanted to say. In Germany, for example, um, uh, I understand that the situation is that an employer can just write a letter to an employee and say, to use the word that uh, Bart referred to earlier, you're fired. And um, the legal issues are then determined outside. In, in the arbitration. And we've gone a step towards that by providing for, in Section 188A, these um, these uh, so-called pre-dismissal or whatever they're called, investigations or hearings. Um, and one wonders, or perhaps I'll just throw it in <laughs> for consideration, whether the requirement of anything more than an impartial investigation um, shouldn't be sufficient in itself. And then allow the employer to do its impartial investigation to consider whether that uh, justifies dismissal if the conclusion is that it does justify dismissal dismiss and then and then let the independent external arbitrator provided by the LRA um, decide whether that decision was correct. But again, we're probably leading, we're going down all sorts of, of channels. Uh, Judge, I, I, I know I haven't answered your questions, but it's, it's about as far as I can take it. No, I'm actually persuaded. I'll reserve my judgment. <laughs> I would be, I would be very interested to see if that filters into some of your learned judgments, which I enjoy very much. Okay, thank you, Prof. That, those are thanks, questions. Thanks, Judge. Thank you, thank you, uh, Prof. And thank you, Judge. Um, there's a Prof. There's a question from Adrian Keith. Adrian, you can simply unmute your mic and your video, for that matter. Hi, uh, Prof. Um, thank you so much. I'm so sorry that um, I've only been able to join a little bit late. I was actually busy with another matter and I managed just to join the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, Prof, if I am speaking completely out of um, turn, then you just ignore it. That's okay. But um, I've got your books. <laughs> As your books over here with me, I'm a. Uh, <laughs> I'm an uh, admirer of your work. Um, Prof, it's a bit of a, a strange question, but when we are faced with um, disciplining employees who have a uh, disability of the mental cognition, um, you know, akin to autism and um, bipolar, those kind of things, I mean, I think those things are becoming more commonplace nowadays in the workplace. Um, I know that the South African Human Rights Commission sets out guidelines um, for, you know, things like reasonable accommodation and stuff like that. But, um, Prof, just in your in your uh, um, in your learned uh, opinion, like I said, hopefully this is relevant, um, especially considering the um, written submissions of of um, 
these disciplinary hearings. So this is maybe another alternative to consider. Um, is there something that you need to provide for more? So, you know, in, in other words, people that maybe cannot represent themselves in a hearing um, and not necessarily having an employee, uh, a fellow employee represent them, but maybe having like a social worker represent these persons who um, have mental um, disabilities and uh, outside representation being allowed, you know, like you're an attorney in that, in that respect. I know that's always a contentious topic. But um, is there something specific now which you know in your knowledge? Uh, especially when it comes to workplaces, they've given a fair trial, more so than, than, than people that don't have uh, these conditions, if you want to put it that way. Uh, it's it's a coincidence that you that you should ask this, and since there's a judge president uh, present, I I must be quite careful in what I say. But I have just completed um, uh, a founding and supplementary affidavit in a matter that deals with an assault committed by a person suffering from bipolar uh, syndrome in a in a fit of aggression and um, my client the employer treated treated the infraction as a misconduct matter and it went to arbitration and the arbitrator said that it had used the wrong procedure and it should have been treated as an incapacity matter. But the interesting part of the award of, of this matter and what makes it uh, pretty much square with what you're saying is that um, in this case, the employee at the at, at the arbitration came with two psychiatrists, not one, but two, well, sorry, a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And um, the employer didn't come up with any expert evidence. But as it happened, um, and this is the point the employer is taking in the matter, the um, the the psychiatrist and the psychologist actually sunk their own client because they came along and said, um, well, um, we think you should have been more patient because this employee could have applied for um, early retirement or incapacity leave. And so the whole thrust of their so-called expert evidence was to buy time for the employee to leave anyway. And, 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 and that's a bit of an own goal uh, if, you, if you think of it. So that, that's the point that the employer's taken. But, and, you know, and that's as close as my experience comes to this, to this kind of, 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 of case. But, I mean, bipolar... Um, you know, where do you draw the line if a bipolar person, as in this particular case, claimed that they were provoked, uh, which was not the case, uh, by a woman sitting in the tea room and then her, him hitting her over the head with a glass uh, thing and then as she fell down, kicking her three times. Um, you know, if you don't draw the line there, what do you, what do, you do with such a, with such a person? Um, do you do you give them another chance simply because, and 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 where do you draw the line between that and other problems? What do you do with a, um, um, what do you call the defect where a person can't stop stealing? Uh, kleptomania. Yeah, kleptomania. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, where where are the where are the limits? So it's a it's a, it's a sensitive situation, but it's a difficult one to to deal with and I, you know I can only leave you with with that 
coincidental bit of recent experience that I've had. In, with, oh, Prof, with, may I just ask you then, maybe to wrap that up then. Um, so would you say it's, it's, it's quite a subjective field and it is dealt on a case by case basis with uh, a reasonableness test? Um, and then secondly, um, just to wrap it up, um, if an if a arbitration um, or, or person running an arbitration were to find the employ, employer guilty of, of um, falling foul of procedural and substantive grounds, would you say that um, a person with mental health issues, registered mental health issues, would that be an automatically unfair dismiss, um, dismissal because of a registered, um, a listed ground? Would that, would that fall within the labor courts? Well, it, you know, it, 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 it could. It would depend upon the way that they, uh, they formulated their case. But, yeah, I mean, um, you know, to target a person and treat them unfairly on the basis, then it, yeah, and then it would, as you say, go to the labor court as opposed to thing. But the issues would remain the same, basically. Thank you so much, Prof. That's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Thank you, Prof. Uh, this question from, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, Sarah Julie Swartz. Uh, you can simply unmute your mic and video for that matter. Um, hi, Professor. It's Sarah Julie hi. Swartz here. Um, I, I just want to get clarity. If the, if the misconduct is not exceptional, is written representations then fair? And again, I'm going back to the issue of cross-examination and disputes of fact, because it's tried that if there's a dispute of fact, it must be referred to oral evidence in order for the other side to cross-examine. And, and again, if, if it's so, so my, my question is, if it's not exceptional, is written representations fair? Well, you know, I, I think you obviously in the maybe group, um, I think the safest way of answering that would be it's definitely prudent to follow the relaxed disciplinary route that is suggested in the Avril Elizabeth home, rather than simply say to the employer, well, give us a written, a written uh, the employee, give us a written statement. I mean, if you take a very, uh, an example of very simple misconduct, um, the employee arrives at work um, uh, and is is given an ALCO test on arrival, uh, and it registers positive. Um, are you going to say to that employee, just give us a uh, give us a written statement as to whether we should dismiss you? Because the employee may be saying, and in fact he may say in his written statement, but I didn't drink anything that day. It must have been some medicine I consumed. Or I went straight to the police station and had a test and registered negative. He might he might have all sorts of explanations. So you might get a, a, a situation where a written a written statement produces the kind of conflict of fact that you're talking about and might lead to a disciplinary hearing. Um, or the employee might say, "Yeah." Um, in his written statement or her written statement, yeah, I had a big party and I only ended at four o'clock and I admit that I was under the influence and I'm sorry. Well, then in that instance, it might not necessarily, uh, it might not be necessary because what's going to be cross-examined uh, unless it's just mitigating circumstances. So I think, again, you know, it depends very much on the facts. <laughs> okay, thank you. For for what that is worth. <laughs> shall we? Shall, I, I don't want people to think that they must stay longer than that they intended, uh, Ahmed. Um, but I'm I'm quite happy to take one or two more questions. Prof, we're going to have a last, um, and that's what I, that's what I was going to uh, uh, about to say. There are many other questions, however, due to time constraints. Unfortunately, we're going to be taking one last question. Thereafter, I'm going to close the question and answer session, unfortunately. The last question is by Dan Sello. Dan Sello, you can simply unmute your mic and video. 
Okay, good afternoon, Ahmed. I hope you can hear me. And yes, and I can hear you fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I just, firstly, Professor Grogan, I, I'm sorry, I struggled to under, to get the citation of Arabia.com. I did not hear, is it Makachwa or I couldn't hear what you're saying? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. Sorry, I'm just turning away. Um, sorry, my computer went off. Um, it is Ngutshani, N-G-U-T-S-H-A-N-E. Oh, okay, I've got it. Yeah, and, and its actual reference is 2009, yes. uh, ILJ at 2135. Oh, okay, thank you very much. And, and, and interestingly, that is a, a judgment by um, uh, Pillay J, who's now sitting in the Constitutional Court as an acting justice, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. My, my question is this, thanks very much, uh, Professor Kuro. Now, you, you have taken us through the circum exceptional circumstances which the employer might employ or use in order to get the employee to to appear at the it, it not sharing in a form of making written submissions. But I just want to find out now, an employee who's been called to appear at the hearing, and for some reasons that I cannot think of an example, what would constitute uh, exceptional circumstances for that employee. That employee also is not able to attend the hearing and insist on making written submissions. Can that employee then conversely do the same thing and insist on making written submissions without being perceived by, employed, by the employer as being either insubordinate or, or just insolent or cheeky? Well, I think there are two, Dan, I think there are two aspects to that question. Um, the, the, the one, let's just stick to the written represent, can an, employer, can an employee do that if employers can do it in exceptional circumstances? So can the employee say, well, um, let's say I've got COVID and I'm self-isolating, um, so I want to make my representations by, in writing. I would say that would be perfectly in order. And in fact, I've just read an arbitration award which had exactly that situation. And the employer said, no, we want you to come to the disciplinary hearing. And the employees, it's, it's extraordinary. I, I don't know if you've actually you've just read this award, but the employee said, the employer said, no, we want you to come. The employee said, I can't and I won't. And uh, the employer proceeded to dismiss not only not only for um, the initial offence, but also for insubordination for not attending. And 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 I think need, needless to say that decision was overturned by the um, by the arbitrator. Um, so yeah, that's perhaps a bit too specific. But but I think in broadest terms, Dan. What goes for the employer also goes for the employee, and that if there are circumstances, and even if the employer should want to, why would the employer want to cross-examine? There might be circumstances where the employer is not happy with the written representations and says, come, and then if the, employer st the employee still says, I won't, then maybe you dealing with a case of insubordination, but the one doesn't necessarily follow from the other. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. I have not read that award, and there's something just came to my mind, and I would really appreciate if you have it, maybe you can give us a citation of it. You, you will be able to read it, um, and this shows how forward-looking I am, in the September issue of the Butterworth Arbitration Reports. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, because that I've just summarised that judgment yesterday, actually. I mean that that award. All right, thanks a lot, bro. Thanks a lot, Atma. Have thanks, fun. Dan. Thank you, Prof. Prof, in lieu of Judge uh, Graham's presence, um, 
I would phrase it in this way. Uh, would you <laughs> would you like to continue your address by any closing arguments or or can I move to con to concluding today's program? Uh, I think I think I'll rest my I'll rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> and and hope that the issues have been satisfactorily aired. <laughs> yeah. By way of conclusion, what remains is to sincerely thank uh, Professor Grogan for his reflective address, appreciation to all those that have participated virtually and shall be watching this session at their leisure. These sessions are recorded and the recordings can be found upon the South African Bar Association website that being www.rsabar.net. I thank you. Ahmed, can, can I thank everybody present for the, uh, the most enjoyable discussion that followed my address such as it was? Please do. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thanks so much, everybody.